Yeah. It's officially nine, but light's not green yet, so I'm not allowed to s officially start speaking until the light is green. Well, I can officially speak. It just won't officially be streamed. Right. Hmm. Well, yes, because I have uh, a, a, a pretty big group of slides. I don't know if I'm going to get through them all. I'll just start. I won't. I won't. I won't hold for you. We're waiting for the green light, everyone. What I missed? Um, you missed me doing a lot of stand-up comedy, um, falling off the stage potentially, or saying I may fall off the stage. It was kind of like, oh, whoa. yes. So they're, they're going to put it on the the, the self website for for next time. So yes. So, so I'll do this now because we've got a little time and it's not, we're not green yet. So in here I'm going to show like this slide that has a lot of the new projects that are out there and how diverse the ecosystem is. So, um, you know, so to illustrate, you know, and I've talked about this on Friday as well, uh, funding of, you know, current projects um, before the, the recession kind of hit. Um, if you had money, you wanted to find cool, innovative ways, and this is how they did it, right? So they would say, Okay, how many people of you can do something technical? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand if you could do something technical. Anything technical, don't really care. Have you ever had an idea? Yes? Then I want to fund you. So let me fund you right now while we're waiting for the green light. I'm going to come out and I'm going to fund your project with a Starbucks. It's a free Starbucks for, for funding your projects in the IT space. You know, so see, that's how funding worked in the last few years is is we would give funding to anyone who cared. And then the light's probably, no, it's still red, so I don't feel so bad. I don't feel so bad. Would you like your project funded? I don't know what you're gonna, pro you probably have a good idea, but that's okay, we're funding projects today. And that's how funding works in Silicon Valley nowadays. If you can do something technical and have an idea and you slap open source on it, we're gonna give you funding. Awesome. I'm still, what? It's still green or red. Just go? Okay, then I have been given the green light, even though it's red light, to continue my presentation. So this is just for you. This is good because this is a beta test. So we're going to talk about the 20 years in open source, the good, the bad, and the dumb. I'm the head of open source strategy at Percona, Matt Yakovit. Um, affectionately called the Hoss, head of open source strategy. Um, I have a podcast called the Hoss Talks Foss. Now, disclaimer, this is going to be really quick. These are my opinions. I'm going to be sharing some stuff that happened, and it's my perception of what happened when I was at different companies. This is not the definitive history. It is one person's idea. And this does not represent my employer. And this is totally a beta test. So let me know how it goes and what I should cut or not cut. So. Open source is a very complex topic. It's had a very complex history. But as, as I was writing this, um, the story evolved. And I could really distill it down into four slides with 70-ish slides in backup. So the four slides, the story of open source, goes something like this. Oh my god, I hate open source. I fear it. It's going to steal all of my money. I need to crush open source. Which is followed by, now people are using open source, so you know what I need to do? I need to control open source. So how do I control it? And then finally, we love open source, right? And this is the story that we go through time and time again when we talk about the open source community and the tech space in general. And in fact, this is repetitive. It's like the Groundhog's Day of open source because companies will come in, they'll love it, then they'll hate it, then they'll try and control it, and then they'll love it again. And you'll see this pattern continue to develop over and over again. You don't need to look far for examples, right? Microsoft, right? Who remembers this? Yes. We all remember the Microsoft famously said that uh, you know Linux is a cancer, open source is awful. You know, lots of people disdained it. But then they figured out, hey, we have to deal with it. So Microsoft started doing some open source stuff begrudgingly, right? And so when they started, they said, okay, well, we've got some open source things that we acquired. How do we handle this? We pigeonhole it into a small group and then we're gonna force everyone into that group. We're gonna segregate it, we're gonna isolate it, 
and we're going to say, yeah, we kind of do open source, but at the same time, we're going to go out there and we're going to lobby that people shouldn't use open source. And so you had this duality where they were trying to control the narrative around open source and what was open and what wasn't. And then finally, open source became the standard for everything. And then they're like, we totally always supported open source. We love it. It's cool. We love open source. Open source is great, right? So again, this is the repetitive nature that we are in when we talk about the open source movement. I've experienced a lot of this firsthand. Um, I started at MySQL AB. And back when I started, it was the early days, right? So it was a very community-driven project. It was something that was very focused on the, you know, the growing of the community needs. We had MySQL 3.2.3, we had MySQL 4. It was pretty cool. Early days, MySQL didn't have transactions. We finally got transactions with the InnoDB storage engine. We're like, oh, this is awesome. But at the same time, MySQL was thinking, oh, well, we're gonna make some money, right? So we're gonna go IPO. And so how do we make money? And so they came up with what wasn't the original, but it was pretty close to one of the beginnings of what is called the open core movement. Now, for those of you who don't understand what open core is, it's to take something that is very community driven, focused on the community, and you're going to make a version that has features exclusively for those who are paying, right? So open source, you get most of the stuff, the core of the product's open source, and then you figure out what around it should be paid for. Now, this caused an immense amount of debate. Now, Mark Atwood isn't here. He was with me at MySQL. Um, he told me a story yesterday about how when this, you know, uh, some of these features that they said, we're going to reserve for the enterprise base, some of the people internally just pushed them out into the public domain before they could announce that, you know, just like, you know, well, let's just click that button. Oops, what are you gonna do? It's already out there, right? So there was a lot of debate there. My first day at MySQL actually was, uh, you know, my first email that I got was a thread where people were calling the CEO the devil, they wanted him to go off and die, like all this stuff. It was crazy because there was so much animosity around that, right? And so that was a huge, huge thing. And it was really because MySQL was focused on the shareholder value. They were trying to figure out how to make revenue, you know, grow the company, nothing wrong with that. And so that focus of taking things that were open and moving it over into the um, enterprise space was something that was a fairly novel concept. Now, at the time, there was a lot of contributions. Anybody sign a CLA for contributions? So there's, there's these licensing agreements out there now that you have to basically, you know, transfer ownership and give permission when you contribute to some projects. They get full ownership of the code. The reason those exist is because in the MySQL space, they didn't have those. And I mentioned InnoDB, which is a core component of MySQL. It gives you the transactional storage. Um, it was owned by a company called InnoBase, who tried to sell to MySQL, who politely declined. So you know who bought it? Oracle. Yes, so Oracle came along and they go, well, we're gonna buy that. And it was something that MySQL was fundamentally dependent on. So you had this open source library developed by some Finns um, that was core to MySQL and what their plans were to develop an enterprise feature. And now all of a sudden it's owned by the big board. That scared the hell out of people, right? Because it was like, oh my God, we cannot put that in an enterprise software because we want to do a commercial license, not an open source license for the enterprise. What are we going to do? So the immediate response was, even though we've got millions of users, stop all development on anything related to this. And so there was a mandate where we were not allowed to fix bugs or to change features or to add things to InnoDB, which was a core part of MySQL. And the fear was, Oracle's gonna sue us if we start messing around with their intellectual property. We never got the rights for it from Oracle. You know, base contributed the code, but that doesn't necessarily matter. So they decided to rethink the storage engine. So we need to replace this. Now, at that point in time, that particular software was about 12 years old. Well, that's 12 years worth of development and features and fixes that have gone in. So they decided we're going to make a pluggable storage engine. So we'll develop something and other people in the open source space will develop something. And also we can just claim InnoDB is a plugin into MySQL, so then therefore we can get around that whole IP licensing thing. 
So they developed what was called the Falcon storage engine, which never saw the light of day, by the way. Um, so everybody, you're going to have to use Falcon, and it's enterprise only, right? So you can use the InnoDB, you could use MyISAM, you could use all these other storage engines, but if you want to use the official blessed awesome sauce thing, you're going to have to pay us. But there's millions of users using InnoDB, using MySQL at that point. In fact, Facebook, Google, Twitter, you know, all these companies built and relied upon MySQL and the InnoDB storage engine. So what do they do? Well, all those fixes that they had started to stall. And in fact, you know, as modern hardware started to ramp up, as well as traffic on the internet, a lot of companies started running into significant bottlenecks. InnoDB was originally designed to run on two core machines max. It was originally designed and, and limited by it, the developer itself to only do 100 IOs a second. The comment here is a legitimate comment. I'm going to limit disk IO to 100 IOs a second because that's all modern disks could ever do, right? And so, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So, so you have that and, you know, you, you get like Facebook or Google who's doing a crap ton of data. They're looking at this going like, well, fix that. That's, pretty, that's a pretty easy fix, right? Like, it's a hard-coded 100, just change it to 1,000, you know, or make it a variable. And MySQL is like, nope, we're not touching that. So what you had happen was other people jump in from the community perspective because the thing that you were fearful of, of you know, some other company coming up and cannibalizing and gobbling up your product, you know, it, it happened in the community because if you are not the disruptor, you're the disrupted. And so new players started to emerge. The company that I work for, Percona, were like, we'll fix it. <laughs> you know, here's a patch, you know. Um, you know, there was uh, Mark Callaghan at Google released tons of patches for MySQL. Um, Facebook released patches, Twitter, others. All of them started enhancing and fixing and pushing code up that never got accepted. And so MySQL was totally focused on this other side. They were focused there. And they didn't want to take any of those patches. They were worried sick over, you know, o over that. And some of us just released stuff anyways when we worked for the company. And then they would come back and then they would slap you on the wrist. Now, the weird thing about this is they started to actually generate additional competition that they didn't originally have. Right? They made the environment where other companies could come in and foster the ecosystem and establish themselves as credible players. And even internally, competition started to rise. Teams internally started to look at, well, maybe we should fork MySQL. Maybe we should release new versions that are outside of this. Maybe we should just go off on our own. And you started to see companies and other things form around that. But at the same time, Sun came along, and Sun said, well, we're going to gobble you up. They bought it. What Sun has that MySQL didn't? A lot of patents. And it's a lot of patents that, well, a certain big Oracle might rely on. So they go, we don't really care what Oracle does. So then it changed everything, right? So they were not afraid to shake things up. In fact, they were looking at ways to increase the ecosystem quite a bit. They had an incubation team that they formed that was focused on all kinds of other ecosystem tools, right? Memcached, you know, integration with SSDs, rethinking the entire database design, um, and then integrating with this new thing that just started to happen, which was the cloud. All of those things were, you know, legitimate. And the people who didn't have a voice before, who had started to establish new patches, new things, they were allowed to fork MySQL. Now, how many people have heard of Drizzle? Oh, oh, one. Hey, cool. Hey, one Drizzle. So. The team at MySQL got into a big argument with the team at the original MySQLers over the design of the database, the bloat of the database, and how they were developing it and testing it. And so they decided to reimagine MySQL for the ground up. So Sun said, that sounds good, just go do it. And then we'll do MySQL in parallel, right? So you had these kind of parallel contribution streams. And so Drizzle was everything that MySQL ceased to be, which was community-focused, open contribute, uh, contribution, slimmed down code. It was really one of the first projects to focus on continuous integration and deployment. Okay? And you know, this brought a whole new set of challenges because all of the tools that you use today didn't exist when this was happening. Right? So, you know, when you talk about, you know, people use Jenkins, Jenkins didn't really exist before this, right? 
OpenStack, OpenShift, you know, Kubernetes, all of these things didn't exist, and they had to be developed to meet this new paradigm. At the same time, MySQL started rethinking, okay? They're like, okay, well now that the shackles are off, we can go ahead and we're gonna ditch that stupid Falcon storage engine. We never really wanted it anyways, even though we spent a couple million dollars on it. We're gonna go back and we're gonna say, InnoDB is awesome and we're gonna embrace it now that we can, we can do so. So they started to focus their efforts on building a better ecosystem and trying to catch up. But at that point, it was too late, right? Other forks, other projects were already out in the ecosystem. You know, they've already spent a lot of time and effort on these things. And so they started to pivot back and then Oracle bought Sun. And then it all became one big happy family, right? Um, and, but that was, you know, really this catalyst for, hey, you know, we started to do all this innovation, it, you know, the, the cat's out of the bag, if you will. Um, so what do we do with these other projects? And Drizzle, of course, was unwanted because Oracle's like, yeah, we don't want yet another database that's entirely community focused. We'll take MySQL because we think we can monetize it, but what's this Drizzle thing? So it's picked up by NASA and Rackspace right, to work on infrastructure. And Drizzle didn't work out, but if you go back and you look at the original contributions for OpenStack, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes Jenkins, Django, there's a ton of software that you can actually follow the coaching tree back to that team. Because a lot of the things that they designed were needed for our modern infrastructure. So imagine if you had a project that you know, like, like we're a team that actually built all that software, that's a really powerful company, but it all went somewhere else, right? And so it got spread throughout the ecosystem. But at that, you know, who, nobody likes Oracle, right? So, <laughs> yeah, who's that, who's that? Uh, so with that acquisition, that led to another round of forks, right? So now we said, uh, we're worried that Oracle's gonna kill MySQL, which they didn't, but we started to say, you know, oh, hello, MariaDB, you know, like, so let's fork that. So Monty, the original founder, one of the original founders of MySQL, we're gonna totally fork this, we're gonna go off um, because, you know, we're gonna do that. And of course it's a sea line because we need something as cute as a dolphin, but not a dolphin, but sort of a dolphin. And then, you know, Percona decided to actually, uh, you know, officially launch a server um, and incorporate a lot of those fixes and patches from Facebook and Google. Um, so there were multiple others that came and went over that time. Those two are the ones that still stand. But it's that kind of love of open source, then, you know, fear of open source, then control open source kind of back and forth you get, right? You know, you, you have that pattern that holds true. And it still holds true throughout the history of not only MySQL and, you know, uh, databases itself, but open source as a whole. And you can apply that to other things like the cloud era. Okay, now back when this all started, most of our testing infrastructure, most of our you know, build infrastructure was all data center, right? It was all on rack somewhere. And the cloud really started to pick up in the you know, uh, early 2000s, um, mid 2000s, late 2000s. You had a lot of people who didn't believe in the cloud, especially in the open source space, right? You know, oh, it's a stupid thing. Whoever wants to do anything in the cloud, it's nothing new. This is just horrible, right? Um, even like, you know, big business, you know, ah, it's complete gibberish. It's insane, right? So it's that fear thing again, where we look at it and we fear what's there. And there were a lot of discussions going on around like, yeah, maybe the cloud's okay for test stuff. It's not gonna be as fast as bare metal. You can't trust cloud providers. You know, it will never last. You know, you only store unimportant things there. You know, who cares? Um, you look at these statements or these conversations that went on and compare it to what you're using the cloud for now. Vastly different, right? It has changed so much. But part of this was the cloud was really pitching that they were a utility provider, like a power provider, right? So this was just a plug in and drop in, right? So it's just like you get power at your house. That's what you're gonna do is you're just gonna click the button and get server compute. It's awesome. You're gonna get your infrastructure at a, at a, at a clicks. But what we, what we realized was the cloud is easy if that's the case. If it's as easy as plugging into your outlet to get power and you can just plug in to get compute, that makes a lot of sense. And so you started to see open source projects start to pick up around building their own cloud, enabling people to provide um, you know, the same sort of cloud infrastructure, but in an open source manner. 
We also saw that that cloud you know, movement became the great infrastructure enabler for many, many projects, right? Because when I was starting out, I had a server or a big box underneath my desk. That's where I did all my development. Well, now I can go spin off, you know, easy two instances and get full environments and, you know, get all kinds of crazy stuff for, you know, 10 bucks. It's like, woo, -hoo, you know, super cheap. Um, and so that became this massive enabler and it generated an explosion of innovation, right? Massive amounts of technology, um, of open source um, was enabled because those, those cloud infrastructure. This is the current CNCF landscape of projects. It's actually, there's another page, I couldn't get it all on one. So it's kind of cut off. Yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, that, right? And, you know, I, I, for those who arrived early, it, I bribed them, um, I funded their open source projects, and, and all I asked them was, do you have an idea? And is it open source? Can you do technology? Yes, then I'm going to fund you. So I gave them funding. So sorry for those who came a little late, you didn't get the funding, but, you know, for those who are in this space or were in the last five years, if you had, an idea, you were technical, and you slapped open source on it, people gave you money. And you can see here that there is a massive amount of overlap in each one of these categories. This is unheard of in the history of technology and software that you have, you know, sometimes 50 or 100 options to do the exact same thing. But it also means that there is a vast amount of overlap, and not all of them are going to survive. But this is really entering this copycat era. Right, so the cloud has enabled the copycats to kind of come out. They've given them cheap, you know, technology, um, and so they want to copy what other people have done, make it successful, and do it a little bit different. Right, so maybe you um, prefer Coke, maybe you prefer Pepsi, and you only want to hang out with the people who prefer Pepsi. And so you go over here and you say, I hate the Coke guys. And so you spin off, even though it's both soda. And then over in the Pepsi side, you might like, I like Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, or Pepsi Zero, or Dr. Pepper, right? So you get these fractions that start to form, and it's like, mm, they're all kind of the same thing. But because open source became the standard for you know, software and became really accepted, this means that open source started to become more of a gimmick and a way for people to enable their project to get more traction, okay? Um, a lot of companies started open source projects not because they believed in the community, not because they wanted contributions, but because it was a, either a marketing activity or a way to drive adoption through freemium. And if you're not sure what you know, the freemium model is, here's, it, here's what it is, right? Yeah attract people with something free, then you get them hooked where they have to pay for something and then they're stuck paying. It's not really open source if you're stuck and you can't move away, but this is the model that a lot of people have been following. But this was something that companies couldn't anticipate. Okay? They missed something about the cloud that was really, really important. Okay? Um, they were all focused on starting this legacy open core model because they're copying the success that MySQL had. And they missed that, you know, people like free, okay? People are gonna modify code to meet their needs. And you're, if your free product is good enough, people are gonna build an as a service or build an ecosystem around it, okay? The disruptor becomes the disrupted. And while they're focused on these enterprise plays, cloud providers said, well, you know, infrastructure is more than just compute. You know, all of these caching technologies, all of these databases, all these other things, that's infrastructure too. So we'll just launch services around the free stuff. That makes sense, doesn't it? And so that's when you get Amazon and other cloud providers accused of strip mining open source because they took what was in the open source space, they implemented it as a service, and then the companies that own that go, well, nobody's buying my enterprise product. Well, you built a great open source product. Everybody wants to use it. So, you know, companies weren't so happy about that, right? And yeah, so they got kind of angry. Um, they, 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 they tried to figure out how can we compete here? How can we, how can we battle with the cloud providers? Because this is just isn't fair. So we need to fix this. So that started the licensing whack-a-mole, okay? Um, and from a licensing whack-a-mole perspective, there have been so many license changes over the last few years, it's ridiculous. 
Okay, there are licenses that pop up all the time. At one point, somebody created a Percona license that said anyone but Percona can use this because they got mad at us for something, right? Like, so anybody else in the world can use it except for you guys, right? So, but you have those types of things that come up. It's like, okay, well, GPL, oh, somebody, you know, is using it for a project and I'm not getting any money off of it. All right, let's try AGPL. Oh, you know what? They're still not afraid of that. Mm, all right, let's try SSPL. Right? SSPL is a license that has become popular with Mongo and Elastic that basically says you can take the software and use it unless you use it in a cloud space, unless you use it as a service. You know, so you can't make money off of our software, basically. Now, if you have followed the Elastic shenanigans, this is a good example of this. Okay? So back in 2018, um, the CEO of Elastic came out and said, we are doubling down on open, okay? This was, this was several years ago, and they said, we're going to release our core product as Apache 2, and then all of our tools as something a little different. Okay, that's cool, right? Because, you know, hey, we, we want to grow the ecosystem, but we also want to make money. All right, that's cool. So they published this that said, we did not change the license of any Apache 2 of Elastic, Kibana, uh, Beats, or Logstash, and we never will do that. Any guesses on how long never is? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they actually had the audacity to name this Doubling Down Part 2 when they actually moved away from open source and they changed the license to that SSPL model to prevent other people from taking it. So just forked it, right? And so now we have open search because here's the thing. Once you release something in the open source space, it's really hard to pull it back. And now we've got this ecosystem who's sitting here going, oh, dang it. You know, back in the day, we could do an open core model and everyone would just pay us money and we could get this big exit. Now what? So we need to figure this out. Any idea where they sought their inspiration from? The cloud providers, they're making money off open source. We can't. They're making more than we are. Let's copy them. And so now everything is becoming as a service. And a lot of times what you're finding is there is a sort of open license where it's SSPL or SSPL-like where it's like you can use this for anything but the cloud. Um, and then it's, but everything else we're going to put in our cloud service. And they start to put those new features in there and lock them in. So this is very uh, common, like you look at like MySQL, um, Oracle has MySQL HeatWave now. All of the HeatWave features are part of OCI, so they're, they're cloud. You can't get them in the open source space. MongoDB, all of the Atlas stuff that's coming out, it's all in Atlas and it's not in Mongo. So they're trying to push people to this model because cloud providers are doing it, they're making money, we want to be the cloud providers because, you know what, first we fear them, now we're gonna try and control them, and then eventually we'll love that model. But this has generated a very interesting intersection, right? We've got more open source, or so-called open source, but we also have more projects that are layering open source on top of their projects, right? We're talking about derivative works, okay? Um, and we also have companies ditching this pure open source model for as a service. So there is, at the same time, an insatiable hunger from companies to develop more software, more apps, be more interactive. Um, and there's more access to free software than we've ever had, right? And, and this easy button enables people with limited training to access it. And so this brings up the law of unintended consequences in a lot of cases, okay? Um, modern open source is often derived from others and other projects, okay? so. If you're going to develop open source um, currently, you're probably going to go out there and find 50 different open source projects you're going to integrate into your project in some way. Could be libraries, it could be you know components to do testing. You're gonna pull this ecosystem in and build your product around it. And you're probably gonna have a lot of different components. But when you do that, you're often not reviewing or understanding what those components are. You're looking at what's the most popular. What's the most popular JavaScript library for this? What's the most popular client libraries for this? 
And so you're building your solution based on a lot of glue. And sometimes even the products are just the glue that hooks these things together. But what happens when one of those components change, right? So if you're relying on Elastic, for instance, and all of a sudden they change their license, everything else cascades down. Log Z, for instance, you know, they, they provided the Elk stack as a service. And all of a sudden, Elastic goes away. Well, that's a big part of the lot, you know, the Elk stack, right? You know, so oh, now we can't offer this. Now we have to rethink. Now, thank God someone forked, so they were okay. But as you start to look at that, you start to find there are patterns that are developing in the modern space that are driving this as well and that are causing issues, right? So what happens if one of the projects that you have accidentally leaks passwords for, you know, customers or, you know, pushes something into GitHub? This happens way more frequently than you would like to admit, but it does happen. You know, the solar winds thing, right? Um, all of those things happen, whether it's open source or not, because it's just bad practice. It's people who don't understand the consequences of what they're doing because it's just push the button and they're done. At the same time, you start relying on tried and true software that's really popular like Log4j, and that causes issues, right? Because now all of a sudden you have a bug and you have relied on this software in order to enable your product. And when log4j happens, now all of a sudden that has that big cascading impact. Now, some people heard my talk on, uh, on Friday, I mentioned this as well, but then there is things like Faker or Colors.js. Anybody familiar with that? It's a few people might be. Basically, you know, there was a person who had a really popular JavaScript library, and he decided to sabotage his own project because he was angry. And so he released malicious code, and everyone who had that code and had it download from GitHub automatically, all of a sudden grabbed it, put it into their systems, and it broke all these applications. Right? Because we're relying on this, on, on this other software. We're assuming that it's going to stay free, that it's bug-free, and that it doesn't have issues, and that people are going to be good actors. And we're starting to see the rise of protest wear, where, you know, hey, if you're working at a certain company, you work in a certain country, the open source is going to behave differently because we have, you know, checked to see where you are and we're going to force you to do something a little different. And we've seen this with morality clauses as well in some software, really hard to enforce, but we're starting to see this ecosystem start to churn a little bit. And of course, that leads to government looking into how do we help with this, <clears throat> help with this and regulate it a bit more. Um, that's always awesome. But this movement continues to evolve, right? So whether it is you know people nuking their own products or having bugs in it and you're relying on it, or them changing the license to have a morality you know component to it. You know, imagine like you're using software. And uh, you know, maybe one of your customers um, is a customer of another customer of another customer of another customer who happens to work with the US government and someone puts in a morality clause in your and software you rely on. You have no idea who your end user is. It just happens to be built one upon the next. So we're in this weird space where we keep on rotating through. And so we fear that how open source is being used. So we're going to try and control it more. So can you really rely on this, right? So, you know, if, if the open source software that you're using is sort of open, maybe it isn't open, um, you know, will it remain open? And especially if it's underfunded and buggy. So what's next in this space? Okay, we all love open source, right? Um, so we all know that weird things can happen and these patterns that we see are going to repeat over and over again. Um, we're going to evolve and change the open source ecosystem. But if the last 20 years is any indication, by the next time we get this big thing, we're going to fear it as well, and we're going to go through this cycle. And so can we break it? Should we? I mean, you know, right now, the way that I see this evolving and going is we're approaching a phase of consolidation. I, I showed you that CNCF slide, right? Big CNCF slide, lots of different projects, lots of diversity. Things are stretched too far right now. Um, so we're going to come into a phase where things are going to start to shrink, um, especially with funding being cut. Um, and it's going to potentially get messy. And that means that projects you rely on might go away. And so are you prepared for that? Can, you know, what, what, what does that look like? Um, from a pure open source project perspective, 
you're going to see more of those grow because if they're already established in the ecosystem and community driven, they're not funding driven. So that means that you're going to have these products attract more contributions, more contributors, and it's going to be a better bet to place your software, your you know, infrastructure in the hands of companies that are taking a more community focused approach. Big companies are going to eventually fear that and they're going to try and control it. So be prepared for that where you're going to see those alternatives. And we're also going to see the increase in the number of decentralized services. Now, Web3, everybody like, you know, either you hate it or you love it, but there will be new opportunities when we talk about decentralized identity or decentralized finance or decentralized cloud, decentralized services. So we're going to see this evolution and we're going to go through this loop again where we are going to fear it for a while, we're going to hate it, we're going to love it, and then we're going to fear it again. But you all in this room hold the immense power because most of the companies that I've you know, talked about or that I've shared, you know, a couple of these, it's really about the power of you and how you shape that ecosystem. Right? When you look at Microsoft, why did Microsoft eventually relent? Because the users wanted them to. Open source became the thing that they couldn't control, and so they had to become part of the community. Whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, you hold that power to help shape where companies invest, where they go, how they evolve. Wow, I got through all the slides that quick. Wow, that was, that was fast. So, so, I thought it was gonna be longer, but you know, like I said, it was beta testing. It was beta testing this. This wasn't live though, so it only took about 35 minutes. So, I'm happy to answer questions. For those of you who didn't get funded, if you have an open source project or an idea, or you are technical, or you're in this room, feel free to come up and I'll give you something. I do, I have, I have, I have funding here. There are Starbucks gift cards. If so, if, if someone wants coffee to fund whatever crazy idea or technical thing they want, I have some cards. Questions, comments, concerns, disagreements, Happy to discuss. That's okay. You don't have to have one. I can give you another flask if you want. I have some extra flasks. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, oh, oh, well, we're not recorded anyways, right? <laughs> so, yeah, is, is, is this a corporate responsibility or an individual, you know, contribution? I think it's a combination of the both, right? If you, if you want to get better um, in, you know, supporting the community, uh, companies need to contribute patches and fixes and help the open source ecosystem as a whole, but individually, we can make better choices as we design, you know, applications and pick projects that truly embrace the open source spirit and community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a common problem with... Uh, yeah, this is a common problem, right? So we need a new model for funding projects that everybody uses. Um, and there are companies that are looking to do it and foundations that are looking to help with that, but we're not doing enough there. Um, and, you know, some people have argued that, you know, it should be some part of a greater organization. Uh, Tidelift, for instance, they try to sell subscriptions to help maintainers. Um, there are other projects that do that as well, or companies. Um, but we haven't done a great job because I'll be honest with you, I have not seen anybody successfully monetize the donate button. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has, but you go to a co you know like a project, you go download. Uh, how many people actually have donated in this room? Uh, anybody? Uh, like three. So so yeah yeah. So maybe like maybe like ten percent, and you're probably not going to donate like thousands of dollars. You're probably going to donate like ten, you know, or buy somebody a coffee, um, you know. But it doesn't need to be just monetary. A lot of times it can be feedback or help. Um, the cycle when we talk about developing open source software and, and getting contributions, I like to call it, you know, you start in the open source hippie phase, right? And, you know, a lot of us are, you know, uh, maybe that's derogatory, I don't know, but I'm an open source hippie, right? Like, so I'm like, you know, hey, I want to develop this to make the world better. I'm going to, you know, contribute because maybe somebody else can use this. And then all of a sudden big companies start to rely on that software and then they start opening up bugs and feature requests. 
at a rate that I can't support myself. And then I feel bad because you know what? I really want to help the community, but I can't because now so many of these large companies are impacting my ability to contribute and to work with it. Um, you know, and it's not that I don't want to help them or they don't have good ideas. It's just that the volume that they're coming in with, it's a support, you know, setup. Yes. It's yeah, yeah. So it's a labor of love. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what's funny is a lot of times I mentioned kind of the derivative works, right? So, you know, you mentioned open SSL. How many products is that embedded in? It's like log4j. How many products is that embedded in? And none of those products are really paying any sort of like, you know, support, royalties, or help downstream. They might contribute bug fixes now and then if it is in their best interest. But I'll be honest with you, I've talked with people at big companies where they talk to me about OSPO roles, open source program office roles. They're like, man, we really want to get people to contribute upstream. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, they're working on projects, yeah. You know, how much time do you give them to work upstream? And they're like, none. So you're asking them to work like 20% more and get nothing out of it. Why would you ever do that? It doesn't make sense, right? Um, and they're like, oh yeah, maybe we should give them some time to work on these projects if we want them pushed upstream, but they don't. You know, but you, you're right. You know, we need to figure out a way to not only not only help and fund, but also figure out ways to contribute and share that load, right? If you're using the product and you can answer questions on people's you know GitHub issues, if you can answer you know questions in their forums or in you know their chat, do it. You know, if you can provide feedback or a quick fix, do it. It, it really does help. I do think that's one thing people need to start doing is find that one project that's Greg Steerage and then go to that developer, learn everything you can about that project and become their developer. Because so often we think we take for granted what we use on a day to day. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be a great, great way to help. Just find, find the one, become the expert, and become their support staff. Yeah. Project, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, just, you know, you, you know, they'll really appreciate it from, uh, you know, if you're contributing code, um, you know, that's great. If you're just helping out with those support tickets, even if you're doing documentation, that can help, right? Because a lot of questions that come in are just usage-based, right? So you're, you're getting a question like, how do I set this up in this environment? Well, if you've already done it and you can provide that documentation, then I don't need to answer that question. Yes. That's a huge issue, right? And that's that's where, you know, that log4j issue, right, happens. I didn't I didn't know that I had log4j in my thing, and now all of a sudden I'm, I've been hacked, right? Um, and and it and it happens not only from a funding perspective, but also a design and you know a software perspective. People just don't understand what all components are there, because you might grab a component, and that component has five other components that has five other components each, and all of a sudden you've deployed a thousand different versions of packages that you didn't even know you had. And, and a lot of software doesn't do a great job keeping up to date with the latest versions as well. And so now you've got, you know, a dependency nightmare where you might have, you know, six layers of the exact same library but different versions because each of these components relies on something different. And a lot of this is because we are turning more into a solution-based, you know, society where we're developing solutions based off of all of this other software that's out there and it's bolted on top, one on top of the other. And unfortunately, if one, you know, string, the wrong string gets pulled, things, you know, bad things happen. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Yeah. No, that happens all the time, right? I mean, like, like that is a cascading impact. It's like the faker and colors that recently got all the press, right? You know, somebody does something. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. But I appreciate you hanging out here today. Um, so as my beta test crew, should I give this talk again? Just raise your hand if I should give this again. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, good. I'll give it again sometime. You know, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know, when you develop it for the first time, you want that feedback. See, you just participated in my open source community. So I appreciate all of you participating. I love feedback, right? Um, but if you didn't get funded today, swing on by up and I'll give you some funding for, uh, for your troubles of, you know, thinking about something technical. Uh, I'm like a VC, you know, I've got money to burn. I don't care which project it is, maybe it'll make money. Eventually, you know, you know, it'll come out. So. Right. <laughs> yes, clap, thank you. Is there a Patreon for what? I mean, everybody has their own kind of like thing that they're trying to do. It depends on the project, uh, product itself. It's not like one, you know, giant ent entity. Yeah, right. So there's there's different foundations and things that sponsor different products, like Linux Foundation or CNCF. They're going to have their very specific things. Apache Foundation has their specific projects that they're working on. So all of them will accept funding in some way or another. Um, but there are a lot more projects now that have zero funding and aren't associated with any of those foundations. So you'll get a lot more of the donate button type things. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, that there there are a lot of those as well. Like you know that that's one that's starting to become more popular. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna take a selfie with that, with with all you fine people. Look at this. Hey! Yeah, that's cool. All right, cool. I can go on my Twitter. Actually, that's just to tell my boss that I actually did work this week. <laughs> Right. Well, no, no. You got to prove, like proof of life, right? This isn't streamed, so I can say that. <laughs> slide one. What's on slide one? No, no, that's okay. M many people haven't. Is there? Let me see. Going way back, going way back, going way back. My 20 years in OSS, the good, the bad, and dumb. Open source. Oh, on me? The Hoss? Head of open source strategy? Uh, you can find me at M. Yankovic. Check out our podcast. Mail me at. That's it. Is there something else here? Or maybe on like my disclaimer slide? Here. <laughs> Flip this around and you can tell Oh yeah, this one is not so good. Here. Thank you. <laughs> you just take that. You can tell me where this is. There. Yes. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's this one? Yeah, I threw that in last minute. Yes. Okay. See the first one? No. No, no. You read right over the mist. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. My editor's at ICC. Ah, appreciate it. I'll, I'll make sure to fix that. He was emphasizing mine. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there we go. I, I, I got a Did point. anybody not here for funding? Is anybody here for funding? Sure. <laughs> We're giving away cars to people who come to conferences. Actually, my girlfriend has a good idea about something. There you go. If you've got a good idea, I'm, I'm with a VC today. I'm practicing being a VC. If you have a good idea, you can write something or do something technical. Here's some money. <laughs> I, I funded your project initially. <laughs> An investor. <laughs> Right? That's always the most difficult. But, uh,
I think it went pretty well. Um, I was happy that it didn't take as long as I thought. I ended up with like 70 slides, and I'm like, I don't know if this is going to, and it only took me like 35, 40 minutes because each slide was just basically like. You run through 70, I got 13. Mine's going to be short. And Mark can attest to this. No, he's not. No, I, yeah. Um, because I, I went through like, you know, how uh, a lot of companies and projects are just trying to copy the last person on it. You know, so, and they don't realize, you know, hey, disruption's off. And brought up the product. Uh, but not in a negative light necessarily. It was like, 